Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about cancer of the back of the throat, cancer of what we call the oropharynx. Now, traditionally, it's been thought that this is a condition that's caused by cigarette smoking, by alcohol, by poor oral hygiene, maybe periodontal disease. But those are the causes of cancer related to the mouth and the lips and the gums and the cheeks. Cancer of the back of the throat, cancer of the oropharynx. 70% of the cases are now thought to be due to HPV, human papillomavirus, an infection. If we look at cancer of the back of the throat and contrast it with cancer of the front of the mouth, cancer of the back of the throat occurs in healthier men, men with less cigarette exposure, higher socioeconomic status. It's associated with a change in the sexual habits, an increase in the number of partners, an increase in the number specifically of orogenital sexual contacts. And it's important to realize that there typically is no obvious external sign of the HPV infection either in the mouth or in the genital area. Every single day, 12,000 children and young adults will become infected with the HPV virus over the course of a year will be more than six million new infections. The Centers for Disease Control suggests that more than 80 percent, 80 percent of the population is going to be infected at some point in time. If we look at HIV, the AIDS virus, there are only a hundred new cases every single day. Let's talk for a moment about all HPV related cancers. In 1999 there were about 30,000 the number increased by 50% in 2015 when there were about 43,000 new cases. In that same time period, the incidence of cervical cancer decreased by about 1.5% per year. On the other hand, another HPV-associated cancer increased at the rate of 2% in men, and that was anal carcinoma. And anal carcinoma increased by about 3% per year in women, and especially in women between the ages of 50 and 70, it increased by about 5% per year. If we talk about just cervical cancer for a moment, 1999, 13,000 cases diagnosed, 2015, fewer than 12,000 cases diagnosed. That means the incidence of cervical cancer actually went down went down in all racial groups and all ethnic groups. So HPV, if it's going to cause cancer in women, is most likely to cause cancer of the cervix or the vulva or the anus. In men, on the other hand, HPV tends to cause oropharyngeal cancer. That's the most common cancer related to HPV in men. Next comes cancer of the penis and cancer of the anus. If we look at laboratory tissue, from surgical removals, we find that HPV is associated with more than 90% of cervical cancer. And if we look at the oropharynx, the number is about 70%. Well, it's estimated in the United States that HPV is by far the most common sexually transmitted infection, with about 20 million people currently infected with active HPV. Now, it's nearly all sexual, sexually active individuals are going to become infected at some point in time with HPV, typically during the first one to two years after they begin sexual activities. And 90% of the new HPV infections, including the kind that might later go on to cause cancer, seem to spontaneously clear or become undetectable within two years. But in some individuals, they can last for decades. And in those people in whom it seems to clear, it might actually just go dormant and hide. There are at least 200 different types of HPV. There are 40 types that are associated with skin and mucous membrane infection, and 40 types that can be passed through sexual exposure, typically through genital exposure, sometimes through mouth and throat exposure. It's known that nine of these different types cause cancer. Six more are suspected of causing cancer. Now, we said that there are about fewer, just slightly fewer than 12,000 cases of cancer of the cervix. We do a lot of screening for cancer of the cervix. We do a lot of testing, the pap smear. 
On the other hand, if we look at oropharyngeal carcinoma, there are about 19,000 cases that will be diagnosed this year of oropharyngeal carcinoma, and only about 3,500 of those are going to be in women. The overwhelming majority of oropharyngeal carcinomas are going to occur in men. Somewhere around 16,000 cases in men. That's more in men than all of the cervical carcinoma in women. 80% of oropharyngeal carcinoma is going to occur in men. There's been a dramatic increase since 1973. In fact, the number of cases of oropharyngeal carcinoma has tripled in the past 20 years. The infection at the present time with the high-risk HPV, that affects about 7% of men and about 1.5% of women in the throat. The first concept that HPV might be associated with cancer of the head and neck, squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck, was 1983. And early on in those days, there wasn't really any distinction made between the front of the mouth and the back of the throat. It was all thought to be the same basic cause. Then in 2009, the International Agency for Research on Cancer said epidemiologically there is no question cancer of the tonsils and cancer of the back of the tongue and cancer of the throat, it's caused by HPV. It's estimated if we look at oral infections at the present time, right now, 10% of men and somewhere around 4% of women are actively infected. Now, once a person develops the infection, as I mentioned, it tends to clear over time, but it tends to clear less in older individuals than younger individuals. The types of HPV that are associated with cancer, mostly type 16, sometimes type 18, lesser type 31 and 33, if you have infection with any of those particular types of HPV, your chance of developing cancer increases anywhere between threefold and 230 times. Many people, even though it appears to spontaneously clear, may become reinfected or develop a recurrence. Now, interestingly, most of the time when a person develops a recurrence, the person is at that time celibate. So that means when the virus disappears, it doesn't really disappear. It just goes dormant. And then the second infection appears to be a reactivation. Now, it infects the basal layer of the tonsil. There's a special kind of epithelium there. By the way, it also affects the basal layer of the skin. That's what causes the typical wart. Now, 40% of young adults think sexually transmitted infections only come from vaginal sex. They don't think that oral sex is really sex. They think it's relatively safe. But it's interesting and important to note the cancer of the head and neck is the sixth leading cause of cancer in the world, has high mortality. There are 600,000 cases of head and neck carcinoma this year. 300,000 people will die in the world. 100,000 are going to die from oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, HPV-related in the overwhelming majority of cases. So if we look at sexual habits, about 80% of adults in the United States report ever performing oral sex. The highest incidence happens to be in white males, have the greatest number of partners, and they tend to begin their orogenital sex practices at a relatively younger age. So people who were born after 1960, there's about a 60% likelihood that they will have had orogenital sex at some point in time. Older individuals, only about 15%. Well, if we look at the number of lifetime sexual partners, the more partners you have, the greater your risk of infection. Even among those people who have no in sexual activities, there's still about a 2.5% chance that they'll have the HPV in the mouth, in the back of the throat. That increases to about 15% in those individuals who have more than 10 sexual contacts. In men, it seems to level out after about 15 partners, and women about after four oral partners. And it seems that women have protection against recurrent virus more so than men because women develop seroconversion. They develop antibodies. Men tend to less commonly develop antibodies, and with less antibodies, lower level of antibodies, it seems that there's less protection. Now, is it possible to become infected in the back of your throat through means other than oral sex? Yes. 
there are contaminated utensils or maybe some medical instruments. But it's interesting that passage through the birth canal in those women who give birth vaginally, well, their children may be infected, assuming the vaginal canal is infected. And indeed, we find a significant incidence in asymptomatic newborns on culture that they actually do have infection in the oral area, in the genital area, with the HPV virus. It tends to clear spontaneously in the first three years of life. That includes even the high-risk types, the types that are likely to cause cancer. We can find the virus in the tonsils and in people who have chronic tonsillitis at very young age, and tonsil or hyperplasia. From the time of infection to the time of cancer is years or even decades. We don't know at the present time whether HPV virus alone, whether infection with the virus is sufficient to cause the cancer, or does it need something else? Does it need some kind of a peculiar genetic characteristic, or does it have to be combined with some other kind of a cofactor, maybe tobacco or maybe some other environmental chemical? But we do know that if you do develop cancer of the throat, the back of the throat cancer, the oropharynx, and it's associated with HPV, it tends to have a much better prognosis. Now, of all of the cancers of the head and neck, cancer of the back of the throat accounts for about a third of all cases. Typically, it doesn't have any symptoms early on. It's typically developed into a relatively advanced stage by the time of diagnosis. People who have long-lasting sore throat or maybe have an earache, maybe have some hoarseness or swollen nodes, or a painless lump in the neck. Sometimes they have difficulty or pain swallowing a chronic cough. They have unexplained weight loss or pain chewing or a numb feeling in the mouth. Maybe they have an ulcer or a sore in the back of the throat that won't heal for a couple weeks. Well, you go to see the dentist, and the dentist says, I don't see anything. The dentist can't evaluate the oropharynx, will not be able to tell whether you have an infection or whether you have a cancer that's in the process of brewing. When we talk about the oropharynx, we're talking in the area, the way in the back part of the tongue, the back walls of the throat, the area where the tonsils are. That's the area of the oropharynx. That's the area where these tumors tend to develop. And they target the basal cell and they target a transition level. They target a special kind of epidermis. It's what we call a reticulated epithelium that lines the crypts of the tonsils. Unlike in women, where screening with the pap smear or the HPV test of the cervix can give us a clue as to whether we have problems that are going to develop, we don't have any screening for precancers or even cancers of the throat. In women, there's the carcinoma in situ, the precancerous lesion. We don't have an equivalent in cancer of the throat. It seems like with the HPV infection in the cervix, it tends to peak in young women, say age 20, but it's not until about age 49 that the cancer develops. In men, it appears that with the oral HPV, there are two peaks in age, between 25 and 30 and 55 and 60, and then the cancers develop in the late 60s, late 50s, early 60s. The latency period is about 10 to 30 years. Well, there's a better prognosis with HPV-related cancer. If the cancer is related to cigarette smoke or to alcohol, that affects all of the tissue that it touches. But HPV is an infection. It is an infection of individual cells. It's not all the cells in your throat. And as a result, you have some of the normal chemicals present in otherwise uninfected cells. And the good news is once the cells that are infected are eradicated, then it would appear that the tumor is less likely to recur. So if we look at the HPV positive cancer compared to HPV negative cancer, there's about a 30% reduced chance of dying and about a 50% reduced chance of the disease coming back. Now, why does the cancer develop in the first place? Well, the genes of the HPV have certain kind of proteins that they form. And they're responsible for changes in the genes. They actually, some of these early genes in the wart virus, inactivate the tumor suppressor genes in the cells where they're infected. So instead of the cells maturing, 
they keep dividing. They keep undergoing the replenishment of their DNA and then they go and they divide because the checkpoint that the tumor suppressor gene is normally supposed to activate doesn't happen. So it keeps dividing. And then as a result, that's when we get the cancer. The cell doesn't mature. When the cell doesn't mature and those oncogenes are present, the oncogenes from E6 and E7, those early genes in the virus, that's the cause of cancer. If we look in the front of the throat and the oral squamous cell carcinoma, we're going to find the E6 and the E7 less than 1% of all the cancers. That means they're not associated with the HPV infection. Back of the throat, 60 or 70% are going to be positive. The non-oncogenic HPV, they still make E6, E7. They just don't seem to make as much. Now, there's a lot of talk about vaccination. Vaccination for girls in 2006, vaccination in boys 2011 started. Routinely recommended between ages 11 and 12. Typically, two injections, but if you start getting the vaccine after age 15, three injections. It certainly seems to decrease the benign tumors in the cervix, decreases the incidence of HPV in general and cervical warts and even cervical precancers. Can we say anything about its likelihood in preventing the oral squamous cell carcinomas? It's much too early to make any kind of comment. We do know that the vaccines tend to be relatively expensive. The Gardasil 9, which is the current vaccine, with a discount coupon is still about $220. It's estimated that if everybody gets vaccinated and if the vaccine works, and if the vaccine actually maintains its effectiveness over a course of many decades, then we're gonna start seeing a reduction in the incidence of oral squamous cell carcinomas but it's not going to be until about 2040 or 2050. Traditionally, the treatment has been either major surgery, lots of chemotherapy, lots of radiation. It's a horrible condition to have to go through, horrible treatment. But fortunately, over a period of time, we've realized that there's a much better prognosis with oral squamous cell carcinoma related to the HPV, that's the oropharyngeal, the back of the throat carcinomas. So there's a de-intensification we don't use as intense a therapy, and we still get as good a result. So if we look at the two-year overall survival for HPV-positive oropharyngeal carcinoma, it's about 95%, as opposed to HPV-negative when it's only about 60%. So bottom line is you have to be careful. If you have chronic throat symptoms that don't seem to go away, see your doctor. Be careful about sexual practices because unfortunately there are an awful lot of bad actors out there, bad viruses that you don't know are lurking. You contract them. They can hide inside your system for years to decades before they cause problems. And when they cause problems, they tend to cause pretty bad problems. So anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thank you.